evening, everyone, and welcome to what we know will be an informative and thought-provoking meeting on some of the economic and ecological consequences of liquefied fracked gas development. We prefer to use the term fracked gas because there's really nothing natural about it. And when you change the way you refer to things, you often change the way people start to think about them. If you've not already done so, could you please turn off your cell phone or put it on to vibrate? And I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here tonight on the unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Council of Canadians, it is Canada's largest citizens organization with members and chapters across the country. It brings people together to work on issues of social, economic, and environmental justice. Its strength comes from our supporters across the country and around the world. We do not accept funding from corporations or governments, so donations are vital to our work. With the recent election of Prime Minister Trudeau and a Liberal <coughs> government, Many Canadians breathe the sigh of relief at the sunny days ahead. Unfortunately, about the same time, donations to the Council of Canadians and many other advocacy groups dropped off significantly. You may have noticed that there is still a lot of work to be done. If you support the work that the Council has done and continues to do to hold governments and corporations accountable, while fighting for issues like public health care, democracy, and water as part of a shared commons, now would be a good time to support the Council's work with a monthly gift. This can be as little as five or ten dollars a month, but it will give the Council of Canadians stable funding that they can rely on when planning the work that needs to be done. There are forms here at the welcome table to make uh, monthly or one-time donations to the national organization. And of course, you can always go online to canadians.org where they have a donation page. Just a little housekeeping. Next month, our chapter will be having our annual general meeting on Thursday, November the 10th. As well as reviewing the work of the past year, we will be repeating our chapter chat format with small group discussions about our current campaigns around water and public health care. Nobody will ask you to let your name stand to be on the steering committee, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you want to volunteer, we're always happy to accept new steering committee members. For most of us in the Comox Valley, fracking and the development of LFG plants is something we only hear about when Premier Clark or the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers are painting rosy pictures about BC's future prosperity. However, for the people of northern BC, fracking and LFG liquefaction plants are something that is affecting their land and water, their communities and their health right now. As you may have read online or as you came in tonight, the Comox Valley Chapter has decided that all donations that are collected tonight will go to support Skeena Wild and the Skeena Corridor First Nations with lawsuits, one of which was launched today in the federal, the federal court in Vancouver, asking the court to overturn Ottawa's approval of Pacific Northwest LNG. We want them to know that there are many people here in southern BC who support them and their cause. And now to get the absolute <laughs> to get on to the main purpose of our meeting, we are pleased to welcome two speakers tonight. Each of them will have an opportunity to speak, and then we will have time for questions and answers. I put sort of a rough timeline on the um, on the board. We're trying something new for us this evening. On each of your chairs, you will have found an index card. As Ben and Emma make their presentations, please jot down any questions you might have. If you need a pen or an additional card, just put your hand up and there are runners who will bring you what you need. I'd like to begin by introducing Emma Louie. Emma is the national water campaigner for the Council of Canadians. She is also a researcher on water issues, human rights, 
Water Privatization, and Corporate Social Responsibility. You can follow her blog on the Council of Canadians site. Emma. Hi everyone, good evening. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I just also want to recognize that we're on the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. I uh, want to thank the Comox Valley Chapter for organizing this event, and uh, Kathy and Sue and Linda and others that I've met this evening. Uh, it's a very uh, timely event given that the, the Trudeau government just recently approved the, the Pacific Northwest LFG terminal. Um, and so very excited to be here to, uh, to have this discussion with you. And then always excited to, to come to the island. I really love it here. So it wasn't very hard for me to make the decision when Kathy invited me to come. Uh, the last time I was here was last summer, so it's been close to a year, uh, so very excited to be here. You might have to be tighter to the mic, Emma. There's people in the back oh. end here. Is that better? Can you hear me? You almost have to be touching it. Okay, is that better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there that's better. Go. Okay, I'll, I'll try not to move. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so maybe just a quick show of hands first. Uh, who here knows what fracking is? Okay, most of you. Okay, that's amazing. I was just saying to uh, Ben, so I've been with the council for about uh, six years, and I started working on fracking about five years ago, and I was just saying that Ben wrote a paper a number of years ago, and it was one of the few papers that was on fracking and, and anything comprehensive and anything uh, in terms of the data that we could use on, on water use and so forth. And it was really, you know, talking to people. A lot of our chapters actually raised this issue as an issue that was happening in their communities, um, which was one big reason why we started working on fracking. Uh, and so, you know, the I think public understanding and the public knowledge of of fracking has really ballooned in the last uh, in the last few years, and so it's it's rare actually to meet somebody that hasn't heard about fracking. So that's really it's really great to see and better understanding of, of the impacts on on water and climate and public health and so forth. Uh, next slide. Can we get the lights, Emma? Just be yeah, sure. So I'm just going to talk quickly about the the impacts of fracking, though you probably know uh, a lot of this, but one of the big concerns about fracking is, is the use of water. Um, and so uh, so based on, on this image, which there's you know, various Im images like this, um, a really big concern is just the, the impact on, on the water table. So fracking happens by blasting uh, sand water and chemicals into shale rock or, or coal beds um, to extract uh, natural gas or, um, or oil. Um, and a lot of water is used. Uh, so in, in, 20, in 2014, uh, next slide. In 2014, it was documented that um, that uh, the wells that have been fracked uh, used uh, quite a bit of water. So it was they estimated eight billion liters of water for to frack around 640 wells, um, and that's the numbers uh, from the BC Oil and Gas Commission. Um, though there are concerns about whether those numbers are accurate because. Uh, for example, for a long time, uh, companies didn't have to report the amount of groundwater that they used. Um, and then you, you likely know with the BC uh, Water Sustainability Act that uh, now only now governments are tracking how much groundwater is being used and so forth. But before, there was no regulation of groundwater. Next slide. Uh, another concern is chemicals. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Some of the, the writing is quite small. If anybody's interested in the slide, I can, I can send you the link for it, but it's quite an interesting chart to look at. It's just some of the chemicals that are used for fracking and it, and it documents the, the, the various health effects of it. Um, so there's big concerns about um, the chemicals being toxic or carcinogenic or harmful to health. Um, Environment Canada, a number of years ago, they had a, a memo that was uh, leaked by or not leaked actually, I think it's an access to information request done, and it, it, it talked about Environment Canada reviewing um, some of the fracking chemicals used in Quebec and, and the US, and they showed that uh, out of 265 different chemicals, 
only uh, only 13 of them had been investigated. Um, a number of them, seven of them or so, were found to be toxic, including benzene and naphthalene. And uh, a quarter of the, the substances were among the, like they were going to be investigated, but about half of them, so half of 265, actually didn't trigger the, or didn't meet the criteria for further investigation. So a lot of the chemicals that, that are being used are actually um, that just haven't been researched, and we don't actually know what the what the health effects are. Uh, we often hear that some governments say no, there are no known cases of water contamination. Um, companies say that as well, but it's actually because they're just not looking. Um, they're not doing the research, so when you don't look for something, then you're not going to find something. Um, so it's a very big concern in terms of how that's impacting uh, lakes and rivers and, and various watersheds. Next thing. Another concern is the is the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so this is probably a well known uh, a well known image for you. It's from the documentary Gasland, um, and there's a lot of different images uh, around with people being able to light their tap water on fire, and that's because of the methane from the fracking process. Uh, so it's it's a big concern in terms of how that impacts the the level of greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions because methane is a particularly powerful greenhouse gas um, and it can trap up to t trap 20 to 25 times more heat in the atmosphere than, than carbon dioxide. Uh, so there are some studies that show fracked natural gas can produce as much greenhouse gas emissions as coal. Next slide. Uh, so I just want to go over really quickly uh, where fracking is happening across Canada. So you may know the Atlantic is leading the way in terms of uh, fracking moratoria. Uh, so Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and uh, Newfoundland have all implemented a moratoria, um, some more permanent than others, um, some with legislation and others. Um, that their, Newfoundland in particular is waiting for, um, they're, they're going through an independent review process and Nova Scotia had also gone through it, an independent review process where the panel had recommended that uh, fracking be, um, be a, a moratorium be put on it uh, indefinitely. Uh, Quebec is one place where there's a partial moratorium in the St. Lawrence River Valley, but the Quebec government just passed a bill this summer that's really gonna open the door up to, to more fracking in the province. Uh, you may know that there is the, the Lone Pine um, NAFTA challenge where, Lone, and this is interesting and, and quite scary, where Lone Pine is actually a Canadian company um, and it used its office in Delaware to be able to sue its own government under NAFTA. Um, and so it's supposed to go to arbitration, it was supposed to go to arbitration in September and I think um, that's still the case, but I don't think that's, that's started yet. So most of the fracking is happening in the prairies uh, in British Columbia. There, are, there aren't any active projects in the Northwest Territories, though the government had approved a project and, and there was drilling that happened in the Northwest Territories. Uh, also, the, the Yukon government uh, approved fracking in the Liard Basin, but I don't, I don't believe that um, it's gone forward uh, there yet. Next slide. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about uh, LFG terminals. Uh, so there are about 20 proposals in, in BC for LFG. There's also a couple of proposals or a few proposals in Nova Scotia and Quebec as well, though definitely the ones in BC have garnered a lot of, a lot of media and public attention. Um, so in, and in terms of what Kathy was saying about you know talking about LFG as opposed to LNG is really important because um, the geologist David Hughes says that 80% of natural gas in the province is fracked. And so most of the time when, when we talk about um, LNG, terminal, LNG terminals, it is fracked gas, or it would be fracked gas. Uh, so communities have raised concerns about impacts on salmon, uh, indigenous rights, uh, and we've seen with the Pacific Northwest and the opposition from the Lac Lam, um, as well as uh, tanker safety and just concerns about, you know, if there's accidents or whatnot. Uh, we've also been hearing that the LFG, LFG projects aren't economically viable, uh, which Ben is going to go into in a little bit more detail after. Um, but just want to highlight that across Canada, and, and this is important, I think, that, you know, it's, it's important to have perspective on how many jobs oil and gas actually creates. And so when you look at Statistics Canada's numbers, 
uh, oil and gas actually only creates 1.3% of the jobs. Um, and actually, when you look at uh, resource extraction as a whole, um, it's the number the number of jobs created is actually quite low. Uh, when you look at the industries or, or the sectors that actually create a lot of jobs, it is actually um, the highest is retail trade, um, which is 12%. Uh, healthcare and social assistance also around 12%. These are the numbers from 2015. Uh, another 12% in manufacturing, 8% uh, is in accommodation and food services, and 8% is in education services. And so when governments talk about, about uh, pushing forward or, or promoting resource extraction or oil and gas as uh, ways to create jobs, it's, it's also for a very small percentage of jobs. Um, it varies from province to province. Um, the numbers in Alberta are obviously higher. The last time I checked it was 15%, uh, but that was before the, um, the, the crash in, in prices. And then in BC, I think it's about 1% as well. So it's still quite low. Next slide. So I just want to talk about fracking and water use uh, in the context of climate change. But we often think about climate change when it comes when it comes to uh, um, warming temperatures and, and greenhouse gas emissions. But I want to talk about it specifically related to water. So things like drought, flooding, and how that how that relates to the fracking projects that are going forward. So I just want to really quickly read Maud's quote. I'm not sure if you can see that from where you are, but I'll just read it. Yeah, some of you can. Okay. Um, I'll just read it anyway. Uh, so, while no doubt greenhouse gas emission driven climate change does have an important and negative impact on watersheds, uh, warming temperatures and speeding up, of, speeding up evaporation, there is another story that needs to be told. The fact that destroying water retentive landscapes is in and of itself a major cause of climate change is not part of the analysis or discussion in climate change circles. So. Something, it's also something that, oh sorry, I didn't finish my quote. Um, oh no, I did, I, sorry, my pages are all mixed up. Kathy really saved me because <laughs> I printed I print, I print, printed a bunch of odd pages and I forgot the even pages anyway. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long week. <laughs> so my, my notes are a little bit mixed up. Um, Anyway, uh, Michael Kravchuk, who works a lot on, on climate change and, and how that impacts water, really talks about the role of water in climate change and how uh, rain or water runoff contributes to rising sea levels, um, the importance of rainwater and humidity in cooling the system of the atmosphere. And so water plays a really important <laughs> role in, in cooling and, uh, and climate change as well. Um, and just to flag, uh, Maud, you may know, came out with a new book in, in September. Uh, September 19th was her, her launch date, and there's some books uh, in the back there. And she talks all about uh, water in Canada and uh, various things like fracking, fossil fuel extraction, and so forth. So it, in terms of drought, um, so last summer was particularly bad for out west uh, in, in British Columbia and also Alberta as well. Um, and so we know that there's many, so there's about 17,000 glaciers um, in British Columbia and they're all melting. Um, and so these are, these are glaciers that feed all the lakes and rivers throughout the west and through the prairies. Um, so when we have such major droughts as we saw last year, um, it really raises concerns about what future water availability is going to be like. And when we have, and, and it can fluctuate based on the region, um, I think that uh, drought or water availability uh, really varies from season to season, especially up north where fracking is happening. Um, but it does raise concerns about when you, when you take into consideration drought, uh, drinking water advisories where people aren't able to drink their water, uh, and then we have uh, oil and gas companies that are taking large amounts of water and, and basically polluting it um, to the point that it can't be returned back to the watershed, uh, raises some really big concerns. So also to think about uh, in the context of climate change is flooding. Uh, so we saw this happen earlier this year in Texas um, where there were some major floods and it really impacted um, some fracking wells. 
so it, flooding can impact water availability um, because it can pollute clean water sources. Uh, the same is the case for erosion and, and landslides. This is a photo from the U University of Texas in Austin. Um, and so this was flooding that happened this, this spring. And this is an image of flush crude oil and, and toxic fracking chemicals that were flushed into the, into the local rivers and really contaminated groundwater and streams and creeks in the area. Uh, and so, and it also impacted the um, cattle and other animals in the area where they, where they found there were some cases where cows drank the, the water that contained fracking fluid and they died within, within an hour or two of, of drinking the water. And so just some really big concerns about how this, you know, how climate change and, and we will, you know, there's concerns about seeing more and more flooding in some areas. There's been flooding in northern um, in northern BC as well, and so how is that going to impact areas where fracking is happening, and where there, you know, there are large pools of fracking wastewater, for example, and how that's going to impact local watersheds? <coughs> Another concern is wildfires. Uh, so, with you know, with with climate change, we're also going to be seeing more wildfires, and this obviously impacts water sources because uh, first. Uh, First responders need to have water to be able to fight fires, um, but there's also uh, concern about uh, contaminants from wildfires that can pollute clean water sources. Um, so it's difficult to treat water after wildfires because of the ash and cinder that goes into the water, and so hard to get clean water uh, after an area has experienced uh, wildfires. So another concern with fracking is earthquakes. Um, so it's been well documented that uh, fracking, well, the link between fracking and earthquakes. At first, they thought it was the the injection of, of fracking wastewater into the ground that was causing earthquakes, which was the case in, in some cases. Uh, but then they're also finding that it's the fracking process itself that's causing earthquakes. So that was um, seen in Ohio, and then this article recently talking about the um, most of the the earthquakes uh, happening between BC and Al Alberta being caused by by fracking. And then also again with uh, with climate change, there is concern that there will be an increase in in earthquakes as well. And so how neat, important to think about how that relates to fracking. So ocean warming, uh, so uh, with climate change we're seeing the warming of oceans. Um, this is particularly important in the context of LFG terminals because some of the terminals uh, are proposing that they use seawater to cool the, the terminals. Um, or sorry, to cool the, um, use, sorry, just use for cooling. Um, so one example is the, the wood fiber LFG plant, um, where they propose that um, seawater from House Sound uh, be used uh, for cooling, and then um, it's they propose that every hour will discharge 17,000 tons of water, um, which is enough to fill seven Olympic-sized swimming pools back into the House Sound, but at 10 degrees higher uh, than, the, than what they took it. Um, and so that raises really big concerns about if the, you know, it seems like these LFG terminals may not go through just because of the price and, of oil and, and, and gas and so forth. Uh, but if there comes a time where that changes and these, these LFG terminals go forward, um, what is the impact of all of these, these LFG terminals using seawater for cooling? And how is that going to impact ocean life and, and so forth? Next slide. Uh, so the, the Water Sustainability Act, I mentioned earlier, um, what came into force earlier this year, and one big concern is that they, they kept the, the first-in-time, first-in-right uh, system of allocating water permits. So first-in-time, first-in-right means that uh, a company or a party that drew water in an area first gets priority. Um, so and it's a system that is used mostly throughout uh, uh, Western North America, um, was implemented during the gold rushes to ensure that miners had access to water. And so it's a system that the, the BC government uses for surface water lakes and rivers, 
um, and is now going to apply to groundwater. Um, so that's a really big concern in terms of companies that are, are using water for fracking. Um, Nestle made a lot of news, um, drew a lot of attention from media because they the rates for groundwater are two dollars and twenty five cents, uh, which is probably the lowest in the country that I've seen. Um, you probably saw there was a lot of media attention on Nestle in southern Ontario, um, drying water and, and outbidding a, a, lo a local municipality for a well. Um, so essentially, the Nestle put a bid in for the well. Um, the the town, Centre Wellington, didn't have. Uh, the funds to to buy the well, but then somebody donated money to them so that they could buy the well and they could secure drinking water for the community. But uh, but the well was actually then given to Nestle, and so that raises really big concerns. And that actually could be even worse, I would say, in British Columbia because of this system, because of first in time, first in right, that. Comp bottled water companies or, or extractive industries could be given rights if they drew water in an area first. Okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about extractivism. Um, so fracking is, is one form of extractivism, uh, but it's just basically the, uh, like an economic model that, um, that relies on extraction of resources, whether that be water, oil, um, uh, minerals, and, and so forth. Uh, and it's really an economic model that we're seeing being pushed by various governments. Um, so, and important to think about that in the context of uh, colonization and uh, indigenous rights. So the Council of Canadian Academies did a report that pointed to uh, the fact that fracking occurs largely on indigenous lands. And this really has an impact on uh, the local environment for food, water, and uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, it's also talked about and warned that, uh, that fracking, as it expands, is really a risk to the quality of life and well-being of some of these communities, um, and, and really impacting like, their ability to use the land, uh, access water, clean water, and so forth. And, and you probably know the, the drinking water advisories in indigenous communities is consistently over 100. So at any given time, there is well over 100 drinking water advisories in First Nations. Uh, and some of them very, very long, uh, long standing. So some of them, you know, I think about two thirds of them are actually five years or, or longer. And then some of them go up to 20 years or so. And so it's, you know, a really big concern. And so fracking is happening in these communities where there's already drinking water advisories or drinking water problems, it raises further concern about it. Um, so I'm just gonna, next slide, talk quickly about uh, trade agreements. Uh, so extractivism and, and fracking can really be supported by these, by trade deals like uh, TPP or NAFTA or CETA, and, and we see this with the, with the, the challenge with Lone Pine, um, that it was because of Quebec's moratorium on fracking the St. Lawrence River Valley um, that prompted Lone Pine to sue the Canadian government. Um, so the concern with these trade agreements is, is the ability of corporations to sue governments for various policies, whether they be water policies, health policy, um, environmental legislation, and so forth. Um, and it's the investor state dispute settlement clauses that, that gives these, um, these companies the rights to do that. Uh, and then also NAFTA in particular has this uh, proportionality clause where, the, where the, the Canadian government is essentially locked into how much energy or raw resource it supplies to another country. And so when that happens, if they're locked into like how much energy they have to give, uh, then that means they're also locked into how much water is being used. And so the proportionality clause is essentially that if, uh, if, Canada, if Canada decreases its energy exports, for example, to the US, then it has to do it proportionately to what's happening in Canada. And so it, it means that if, they're going to, if the Canadian government is going to reduce uh, energy exports in the US, then it also has to reduce its own energy development. It's, it's a very strange clause. I don't actually really understand it myself, but somehow like the, the decrease has to be proportionate. So anyway, uh, next slide. 
it, and so it raises big questions about the human right to water, right? Uh, and so it's something that the, the UN had recognized a number of years ago. The Canadian government um, had uh, for a long time denied that the human right to water existed. Uh, they finally did a number of years ago, but they still have yet to implement it. Uh, and this is, it's particularly important to not only a push for the recognition of the right to water, but also expand how it's applied. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we think about the right to water as just a government uh, providing water sources, but there's also a responsibility, and, and Maude talks about it in a report that she wrote on the human right to water, but that uh, it's related to a government's responsibility to prevent third parties, so companies, to uh, not pollute water, because that's also that also impacts people's ability to access water. <laughs> And second last slide, so you probably recognize the person in the photo. <laughs> um, so that's our Kathy. Um, so this is at the Courtney River. Um, this is related to the uh, Every Lake, Every River campaign that we launched uh, last fall. And it had to do with, um, or it has to do with the restoring the Navigable Waters Protection Act. So you'll likely remember that the Harper government had uh, gutted uh, a lot of various pieces of water legislation and environmental legislation including the Navajo Global Waters Protection Act, um, where that government removed uh, protections from 99% of the lakes and rivers, uh, so that it's only 97 lakes, 62 rivers, and three oceans that are protected under the Navigation Protection Act, which is what it's called now. Uh, they also exempted a review of pipelines, so pipelines like Kinder Morgan uh, Energy East are going forward without review of how they impact um, navigable waters. And we actually just launched a report yesterday uh, that looks at four case studies. We look at the Ajax Mine, uh, Energy East, um, the Kias Dam in Manitoba, and the transmission line in Manitoba as well. And we really tried to pull out uh, the different bodies of water in the different waterways and how the community uses those waterways. And so oftentimes fishing is impacted, um, oftentimes uh, the local tourism industry really relies on, on a waterway because you know people go there just for the, the white water rafting or, or whatnot. And so you know really wanting to, to draw out that moving forward with pipeline projects actually does impact other, uh, other industries. So, and, and maybe just quickly I'll, I'll wrap up. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but um, I'll just quickly wrap up. But the, the Trudeau government has started some public consultations on the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. Um, so they're doing uh, different um, uh, public workshops across Canada. They started in September and then are ending in uh, December. Uh, and then in terms of the Navajo Global Waters Protection Act, the, the, uh, the Standing Committee on Transport uh, Infrastructure and Communities has started a review of it. They're inviting public comments um, and the deadline is November 9th. There's some, some information where Sue is at the table. Um, there's also a, a, webs or a, a link to a blog that I did just in terms of talking points. And it's particularly important for people to raise their concerns in this process because we, are, we know that there are, for example, the pipeline industry or, or the energy industry is really lobbying the, the Trudeau government to keep protections back on. It was actually up at at 6.30 this morning, so it's, I, I'm a little bit tired and, and sometimes grasping a little bit for words. <laughs> um, but I was up at 6.30 and I presented to the, to the standing committee and, and it was actually quite, uh, it was actually quite demoralizing <laughs> because I presented and uh, there was uh, one of the, the conservative um, committee members really derailed the conversation and really focused on introducing a motion to not have witnesses and they actually spent a good like more than half of the time debating his motion and whether he should have done that or not and didn't you know so I spoke literally for like eight minutes and then there were other people that were there and so it really took up a lot of time and and not really hearing concerns from from various groups right and so and then basically the the conservative committee member he he reiterated what, what previous speakers had said. Um, and so the, the, the people that have presented in front of the committee have been the, the um, Canadian Energy Association, um, the Canadian Construction Association, 
There are two, and then important to make a distinction, but there are two uh, rural municipalities in Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, that have raised concerns and about the act, and they actually want to keep the act as is, but I think it's important to recognize there is a distinction to what I think municipalities are asking for, because their concern is that they sometimes have to pay uh, more to expand a bridge, for example, or to build a culvert and go through a rigorous process. But what we're concerned about are the pipelines, the dams, and, and larger projects that are really impacting waterways. And so they sometimes try and limp, lump all of that and they use the, the rural municipalities as reasons to keep the, the protections off. And so just important, I think, to, to realize that there is, there is a difference between a pipeline that goes through 3,000 waterways and a culvert in a rural municipality. And so oftentimes they try and mix that together. So anyway, all is to say it's really important to get your, you know, to get some opposition in because I, I am concerned that they're only hearing from people who are uh, who are in support of, of keeping the, the changes as they are. And we're seeing the Trudeau government backpedal on their promise. So the, their campaign promise was to restore protections and modernize legislation. And now they're backpedaling and looking at maybe putting protections back on only some of the lakes and rivers, maybe more than what the Harper government had proposed. But we really think that it's important to, to put protections back on every lake and every river. So thanks very much for that. Wow, thank you, Emma. That was quite a litany of, of so many things that we need to worry about with regard to fracking and extractivism. But I think it, um, that your final message was very important that we can't give up. If we give up, um, there really won't be anything left. So I, I do urge you to um, check out the Council of Canadians website for more information about how you can have input into the navigable. Hmm. Can't remember what it's called anymore. Navigation protection. The Navigation Protection Act. Because it's important that the government hears from us. If any of you have um, put down questions on your cards yet um, that um, with regard to what uh, Emma has been talking about. If you want to put your hands up, someone will come and pick them up from you. Um, and I think, are you, you ready to go on Ben's slides? Yeah. So I'm very happy to introduce Ben Parfit. Um, Ben's been in the Valley before. You, some of you might have heard him speak in June when he came and um, and told us an awful lot about Site C and what's happening up there. Ben joined the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives as a resource policy analyst in 2005 after years of working as an investigative journalist and a reporter with the Vancouver Sun. He's the author and co-author of two books on forestry issues and currently devotes much of his policy research to natural resources with special attention paid to energy, water and forest resources and to climate change. Ben. These fracking companies. <laughs> That's what we're here to talk about tonight uh, and about their impacts on water. And um, I want to say first off a heartfelt thank you to Kathy uh, for helping to organize this event to the Council of Canadians uh, and for all of you for coming out tonight um, and to, to uh, think about this issue and, and where we are right now uh, in the province. Um, I think I want to begin by saying that, you know, there's a lot... Thank you very much. There's, there's a lot to be hopeful for, um, and, and I think some of the hope has to do with the fact that um, market conditions are what they are, and as a result of uh, a very precipitous decline in, in natural gas prices, um, there's a very realistic prospect that we'll never see an LNG plant uh, on our coast. So uh, I think we have to bear that in mind. The markets work. This is good. <clears throat> um, however, having, having said that, I, I do think that we need to be uh, aware that um, from here on in, 
um, with the natural gas resources globally being developed in the way that they have been developed, uh, much like the forest resources in this province were, we took the easiest and best first. And now we're dealing with the much more difficult stuff. And as you move up the slopes, and the slopes get steeper when you're going after trees, uh, so too uh, does it become more difficult when you go deeper into the ground to get those resources out, right? So what we're talking about is having uh, put a lot of straws into the ground over decades, and we're now finding that it is a little bit harder to get that gas and oil out, which is what has given birth to fracking. Uh, now one thing that I will uh, highlight is that the birth of fracking that I'm talking about is the modern day version of fracking. Fracking has actually been around since the very first oil wells were sunk into the ground uh, in the 1860s. Okay, and uh, if any of you are interested in reading some just eye-popping accounts of what the early days of fracking were all about, you want to read uh, Andrew Nikoforek's latest book, Slick Water, which is an amazing book about one woman's fight against this industry, but that also contains some just jaw-dropping history about the early days of fracking, when they were literally dropping bombs and torpedoes down oil shafts to try and stimulate oil production, okay? So what we're talking about today, uh, as Emma uh, mentioned, is the use of immense amounts of water uh, in the fracking process, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, tonight. I've been asked to talk uh, mostly about the economics of uh, LNG, uh, but also I'm gonna link that in with some of the bad choices that I believe we're making around Site C and Site C's links uh, to the fracking industry. Uh, and how all of us in this room and everyone in the province is going to pay for these decisions uh, out of their pocketbook for decades. We're going to see higher rates, okay? So that's what I want to try and talk about. And I want to try and end, and because uh, I'm, I'm a uh, late middle-aged male and I tend to be forgetful, if I, if I do forget to bring this up at the end, uh, please somebody remind me. I want to close by, by offering a, a few stories of hope uh, for resi about resistance that is occurring in the northeast of the province and that is setting some pretty interesting precedents uh, that I think could uh, bring a, a higher degree of, of regulation to the industry moving forward. Um, so next slide. So this uh, shot of a tanker here is what uh, our provincial government would like to see happening on our coast one day. Um, for those of you who don't know what liquefied natural gas or liquefied frac gas, as it is, is better called, it's, it's really simply taking gas and super cooling that gas to the point where the gas turns into a liquid so that it can be put into the holds of ships and moved elsewhere. And when it arrives on the other side of the ocean, let's say, if we ever have a plant built here, then you simply reverse the process to end up with gas that is then used there. It's all about transportation, about moving one resource from one place to be used somewhere else. And in British Columbia, we're all familiar with that story. Uh, we have been for ever since we've been around, really. Next slide. So I just want to talk about a few of the things we've heard about uh, the liquefied natural gas and its great promise for British Columbia and what we're actually likely to see. And I want to say that much of what you're going to see right now and for the next few slides is derived from work that my colleague at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Mark Lee, has produced. Uh, Mark Lee puts me and pretty much everybody else to shame of the CCPA. He is an extremely prolific uh, researcher and writer. He's an economist. He does amazing work. Uh, I urge you to go to the CCPA's website to look up some of the work that Mark has done on LNG because he's done just great work. He's made Rich Coleman's life miserable. Uh, we know this for a fact because Mr. Coleman has written uh, responses uh, in uh, uh, when Mark has produced stuff because he doesn't like what Mark has to say. So, uh, when Christy Clark uh, really started talking up the benefits of LNG uh, in the lead up to the last provincial election, we were told that there were going to be 100,000 jobs created in this industry. 
That is not going to happen. Uh, it is not going to happen. So looking at the best case scenario, uh, Mark has calculated that between 2,000 and 3,000 construction jobs, these are good paying jobs, would be created for each plant that was built. And at the end of the day, when those plants were operational, two to 300 jobs per plant. It's a far cry from 100,000 jobs. We're never gonna come close to that. Next slide. Okay, the other thing we were told was we were gonna see massive increases in LNG-related tax revenues, okay? And that those tax revenues were gonna go into something called a Prosper prosperity fund, which would be similar to Alberta's heritage fund, which sadly pretty much no longer exists. Um, the likely income or outcome is that because of prevailing low gas prices, we're going to see lower gas taxes. Okay? The other thing to bear in mind is that the projects that we're talking about, if they ever happen, are extremely expensive projects, and there is a sad history globally of. LNG projects having major cost overruns. So any cost overruns that are associated with any LNG project in British Columbia defer the payment of taxes and therefore make it less likely that we're able to get the promised prosperity fund that Christy Clark and others were talking about. Mark's calculation is we end up somewhere between 200 million and 600 million dollars a year under three different LNG scenarios. So we go from a low scenario of a small LNG plant and one larger one to a medium scenario of a couple of large ones and a smaller one to the biggest scenario, which is highly unlikely where we get a build out and we have about five or six massive LNG plants. So 200 million to 600 million. Uh, very important to put that in context. It doesn't represent a lot of money in the broad scheme of things in a provincial budget uh, that is about $45 billion, okay? So somewhere around less than half of 1% to maybe 1% could be achieved theoretically if these things get off the ground. Next slide. So again, $100 million promised in a prosperity fund. Likely outcome, 200 to 600 million over the lifetime of the 30 years, which is the projected time that it would take to grow a $100 million, $100 billion prosperity fund. Um, and if the, taxes, uh, if the taxes that we expect were to materialize, we're gonna end up way short, way, way short of where we wanna be. Next slide. Okay, the other thing to remember is that all of this ultimately is predicated on producing more gas, right? And the irony is that the more gas you produce, the lower the prices tend to be. If we want to take a look at what ha has happened to the Alberta economy, what happened with the Al Alberta economy tanking, is the Saudis and their friends decided, you guys want to play with us? We're going to produce more oil. We'll just see how well you do. So we've seen a glut of oil production, prices fall. Same thing is happening in the natural gas world. And the other thing that is working against investments in British Columbia being made is that we still have a considerable amount of LNG production that is coming on stream, that hasn't yet come on stream, and that is going to come on stream uh, from producers uh, in Alberta and elsewhere, in, or sorry, in Australia and elsewhere in the world. The other thing to remember is that the spectacular revenues that we in British Columbia have enjoyed in years past um, that have gone to pay for many of the things that we enjoy um, did not derive from gas uh, royalties. They derived from the one-time sale of rights to exploit natural gas. So, so sales, tenure sales. So the government essentially auctioning off the rights to drill for natural gas generated huge uh, amounts of revenue uh, in the mid and late 80s. Three and a half billion dollars, right, coming in in some years. Those days are gone. Most of the uh, subsurface rights have long ago been sold. 
So all we're really left with are going to be the royalties and the taxes that are generated from any economic activity associated with uh, uh, liquefied frac gas uh, plants coming on stream. The next slide. So I want to switch and talk a little bit about the connections between the fracking industry and hydro. Because even if we don't get any LNG plants in the province, if there is an upswing in gas prices, and there will be one day, we will see increases in gas drilling and fracking. That is, that is a given. And we have to understand what the linkages are between uh, uh, the drilling and fracking activities and what is happening in the northeast of the province right now uh, as we slowly move towards what could one day uh, be uh, the start of construction of the main works at the Site C Dam. So this is a rather beautiful shot, but ironically, it's uh, a shot of uh, the Williston Reservoir. Next slide. And of course, the Williston Reservoir was created by the building of the W.A.C. Bennett Dam, uh, which uh, impounds uh, uh, Williston Reservoir, which is still um, the seventh largest reservoir in the world by water volume, uh, and uh, brought with its creation basically the decimation of the Sekiyadeni uh, people in uh, the northeast of the province. Next slide. Uh, if you haven't been to uh, the Peace River region and you haven't seen um, the uh, W.A.C. Bennett Dam, it, it really is a jaw-dropping site. It is a massive structure, uh, 60 stories high, impounding this just enormous amount of water. Uh, and it really is the linchpin of the hydroelectric system in the province and is really ultimately responsible, uh, this dam, and the dam below it for about a quarter of all the lights and electricity that we have in the province today. Next slide. And just a short distance downstream of that massive structure is the Peace Canyon Dam. And then about 80 kilometers downstream of the Peace Canyon Dam uh, is this beautiful area, which now looks like this. Next slide. So that's what it looked like uh, last uh, November. And uh, what is going to be happening over the next several months is all the trees that you see in the uh, background of this slide for kilometers and kilometers below stream are going to get logged out this year. And this is all preparatory work for uh, what would one day uh, be the Site C Dam, which is Christy Clark's latest promise to the people of British Columbia. So, with LNG fading as a reality, uh, Site C is, is the one big shovels in the ground project that the government is, is really, really hot on. Next slide. So again, I want to focus on the economics here so that we start to have some appreciation of what's going on. Uh, I talk about cost overruns in liquefied natural gas world. Well, there are massive uh, cost overruns that routinely happen with the construction of major hydroelectric projects. So the projected cost right now for Site C is $8.8 .8 billion. It is the single largest public infrastructure project in British Columbia's history, single most expensive. If we hit 70% in terms of the cost overrun, it is a, almost a $15 billion project. The reason I put 70% up there is that that has been what the average has been for cost overruns at major hydroelectric projects worldwide over the last 40 years. So tran the translation, and should come as no surprise to anyone, is that you and I and everyone else in the province are going to be paying a lot more for our hydro. Our hydro bills are on a course right now uh, over, I think, the next three years uh, 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 which would be the end of a five-year cycle, to go up 28%. And that's before we even begin to entertain and deal with the costs associated with Site C. So realistically, we are going to be paying huge amounts for our power, uh, water-derived power, uh, for decades to come. Next slide. So rising costs for everyone industry included, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, 
Increased costs are likely to mean lost jobs in several sectors of our economy. And uh, we're going to see increased costs correlating with increased uh, greenhouse gas emissions because a lot of the electricity that we're going to be providing ultimately is intended to provide clean, in quotation marks, green power to the natural gas sector so that it will be somewhat less fossil fuel intensive. But if you're producing more gas and you're simply helping these companies green up their operations so that they're burning less gas, at the end of the day, the environment isn't going to care because the gas saved is simply going to be put in pipelines and it's going to be sent to someone else to burn. So the environment and climate isn't going to care where the burning takes place, but we'll be able to claim that our greenfield natural gas operations are somewhat cleaner. Next slide. So I mentioned industry and the costs that it is dealing with. Uh, this is a picture of a pulp mill in Quinell called the Quinell River Pulp Mill. It's a mechanical pulp mill, which is a very important distinction from craft or chemical pulp mills, because mechanical pulp mills are extremely intensive hydroelectric power users. This particular mill, with the cost that it is already dealing with, let alone the cost coming down the pipe in terms of hydro costs, has already applied to the provincial government to take some of its hydroelectricity consumption off-grid and offset it by installing natural gas-fired turbines in its plant because it can't afford to pay for the hydroelectricity anymore. And here's an irony on top of, of that irony. In the very same community, a craft pulp mill owned by the same company, West Fraser, was one of three pulp mills this year that was told to stand down by BC Hydro because BC Hydro had too much hydroelectricity. So companies that were producing electricity were being told, please, don't produce any more because we've got too much. So it's a really important context for us to think about when we're thinking about Site C. Important also to remember that uh, Dave Conway, uh, BC Hydro's uh, public affairs person, uh, was quoted recently on CBC Radio saying that Site C is not about the power we're going to need now. It's not even about the power we're going to need 10 years from now. This is a project that is being built, allegedly, for power that we're going to need 20 to 40 years from now. Okay, that's, that's a public statement by BC Hydro's very well-paid public uh, affairs person. The other thing to keep in mind here is that the costs of Site C are not just confined to the project itself. Already underway in Northeast British Columbia is the building of highly expensive transmission lines that are being built for one customer and one customer only, and that is the natural gas industry. There's one line that has already been built at a cost of $300 million. The main user of the power that is going to be produced from power coming from the Peace River is Shell. Uh, interestingly enough, also an LNG proponent, but one who has recently announced that it's not going to be going ahead with LNG in BC anytime soon. Um, my estimate is that we've got about another billion dollars plus and two more hydro transmission projects that are earmarked to be constructed uh, using Peace River power that are being built specifically to supply power to the fracking industry. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the fracking industry is not going to be paying any more for that power than it would for power that it is already generating using its own natural gas. So at the end of the day, I think it's fair to say that you and I and everyone else in British Columbia is going to be paying hydro, higher hydro bills partly to provide subsidized power to the fracking industry. So I don't think that that's particularly good economics and I think that that's something we ought to be telling our MLAs very clearly that we don't think is in the public's interest. Next slide. So I just want to give you a flavor for these transmission lines. This is called the DCAT line or Dawson Creek uh, Chetland Area Transmission Line. This is the $300 million line. We know that the costs are $300 million because this project was actually referred to the BC Utilities Commission for review. So we 
benefit, the public benefits from quarterly reports, which allow us to see what is happening with this project. Next slide. But I'm telling you that the next two projects that are underway, which will be very similar to the DCAT project, are going to be excluded from BC Utilities Commission review because the government doesn't want the public to see what the true costs of those uh, projects are going to be. Uh, what they're saying publicly is the reason that they, they are um, excluding these projects from review is because they're worried that there would be too much delay and that gas company investments wouldn't happen without those things going ahead. So we're looking at over a billion dollars in transmission line infrastructure being built for one industrial client only, and that is going to add to our hydro bills. Um, it is going to have economic implications for everyone in the province. Next slide. So uh, Emma talked a lot about the fracking uh, uh, scenario, and I, I don't want to go into a great uh, 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 bit of detail about it, but I will add a few, uh, few points to it. So we have to remember that all of the electrification that I've just talked about would be used to offset the burning of some natural gas at facilities like this and replacing it with hydroelectric power. Next slide. So what are the water demands? Let's just think about this for a minute. One modern-day frack job in northeast British Columbia in the Horn River Basin, which is, uh, I have to say, is distinct from the Monty. So the Horn River is the much further north of the two big basins where the water intensity is just off the charts. You're going to need 39 Olympic swimming pools worth of water to complete one multi-well frack job. So a multi-well job is you, you build one well pad, you put maybe nine wells onto that pad, and you frack them all. If you do that, it's 39 Olympic swimming pools worth of water. If we use the highest case scenario, if we ever saw the day where the province realized its dream of maximum build out on LNG, it translates into 22,000 Olympic swimming pools worth of water every year, which is roughly the equivalent of half the water used in the city of Vancouver and the city of Calgary every year, with the very important distinction that the water that is used in the fracking process can never be returned to the hydrological cycle again. It, this is permanent removal. Most water that we use in cities is treated, it is returned to rivers, lakes, and streams, and it becomes part of the hydrological cycle again. With fracking, it's got to be removed. It's that toxic. And here's the thing. The companies that are using this water with the revised water rental rates that have been brought in will pay $46 to the provincial government for every Olympic swimming pool's water that is rendered permanently toxic. That's what they're paying. That isn't enough to process the two or three pieces of paper uh, coming into a government's office for review on, on a well application. Next slide. We've heard over and over again uh, that Site C is going to provide us with clean power and that it is the environmental choice, uh, the, the best environmental choice. This is a shot of Lake Mead. This shows you what has happened uh, over the course of a very short period of time. This is what drought does. To suggest that hydropower is there and will be there forever uh, simply is untrue. And, and we need to be aware of that, particularly at this time of climate change. Next slide. So I want to close by just talking about a, a few different alternatives that we have out there. I mentioned the cost overruns with major hydroelectric projects. The same academic study that quantified that there were cost overruns on average of 70% at major hydroelectric projects worldwide found that at major utility size solar installations worldwide, the actual cost was $4 million under projected costs per project. Okay, so solar is becoming more and more cost effective. In 2011 alone, the price of solar panels dropped 50%. We still have a ways to go in terms of lowering the investment cost 
per unit of power produced, but, but solar power is becoming more and more cost effective. Next slide. Wind power, while still experiencing cost overruns globally at about 18%, again, the costs are, are, are becoming uh, much more attractive, and the overruns are coming in at a fraction of what they are for um, major hydroelectric. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, just a schematic of a central uh, heat distribution uh, uh, facility in Richmond. Uh, Richmond now has plans to uh, create, um, uh, with the use of geothermal power, uh, central distri distributed heat in new uh, operations or new developments uh, in that particular jurisdiction. Next slide. And of course, uh, in the city of Vancouver, a very uh, well-known um, alternative energy source. Uh, these are uh, some stacks uh, near the uh, what was the Olympic Village, a central distribution uh, system in that city, uh, in that part of the city, is using heat captured from the sewage stream to heat the homes that thousands of people live in. So there are lots of living examples out there of things that we could be doing differently that would be far more economically attractive than what we're proposing to do with the fracking industry in this province and with the hydroelectric industry. Next slide. Uh, I want to close by saying that there's a lot more information available, but I also said, and I remembered that I said, that I wanted to provide two examples or a couple of examples of, of local good news stories that point to uh, a better regulatory framework. And I want to return to the northeast of the province for a moment. So I mentioned earlier the most water intensive fracking operations in British Columbia are occurring in the Horn River Basin, which is roughly in the Fort Nelson area. And I've had the privilege and pleasure of working on and off over the years with members of the Fort Nelson First Nation who have been at the forefront of trying to come to terms with this onslaught in their traditional territory of major gas companies moving in and conducting and boasting of world record setting frack jobs where more water is being used than at any other frack job anywhere else on earth. In two separate uh, legal actions launched by the Fort Nelson First Nation and concluded uh, last year, in one case, they successfully challenged the issuance of the first water license in their territory, which was going to grant massive amounts of water to Nexen to use for 20 years. I think it was 20 years. It may have been shorter than that. But it, it was, a, it was a, the strongest, most secure license yet granted in their territory. They challenged that decision, and the Environmental Appeal Board <coughs> yanked Nexen's license. So Nexen lost their license and now they have to go back to square one. Well, that's the first example. The second example has to do with a decision by the Provincial Environmental uh, uh, Assessment Office to exclude a mining company that was proposing to open up to six mining operations in Fort uh, Nelson uh, uh, First Nation territory that would be used to extract the fine grain sand that is used in the fracking process. And through what I'm going to call some jiggery pokery, um, the project was moved off the board so that it would not have to undergo a rigorous environmental assessment. Uh, the First Nation appealed that decision uh, and they won in court, forcing that project to go back uh, for review. The province does, uh, provincial government did not like that decision and that decision has been appealed and is going to be heard by the appeal court. But those are two important victories that were secured by, by a First Nation recently and that are really starting to force the issue about how government and industry respond to the people and communities that are most directly impacted by um, the work that is being conducted by the fracking industry. And I think that we've got to focus on those success stories and where they could lead us um, in thinking about how we approach this issue.
Um, probably in the spring, I'm going to have a report coming out for the CCBA that is going to look at how we can reform um, some of the processes around decisions that we make about allocation of water in First Nations territories. And I'm focusing a lot of my work uh, and attention on the Fort Nelson area. And I think that there's a lot of things that we can be doing that will help to take us in a more productive direction. And I'll just end by listing a few of them. The egregiously low water rental rates that I talked about clearly have to be raised. And I believe that we should be taking the additional revenues that are raised and we should be channeling them in to uh, baseline studies that need to be done to ensure that we have a better understanding of what is going on with water resources. Another recommendation is I don't think that it is appropriate for, uh, and I'm not the only one to feel this, I don't think it's appropriate that the Oil and Gas Commission gets to issue water licenses and permits to the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry is the only industry that has its own dedicated regulator that it can go to for water. I think we need one authority in the province that is making those decisions on behalf of the public and that is accountable. And then the uh, third thing that I think we need, and it's, it's a very simple thing, when I first started working for the Vancouver Sun in the, the mid-1980s, um, I, I, I used to do a lot of forestry stories. And I could go and I could see what Macmillan Blodell, for example, at the time, was proposing to do over a 10-year period or even a 20-year period in a watershed. They actually had to publish plans saying, these are where we're going to put our cut blocks, these are where we're going to put our roads, these are where we're going to put our landings. These are where we're going to put our culverts. This is how we're going to deal with this stream, etc. It was all publicly available. There were open houses held. And at least the public had an opportunity to say, hey, we don't like this or we like that. There is no equivalent for that in the natural gas industry. And I think what we need uh, is companies compelled to provide very detailed plans about where they intend to drill wells where they intel, intend to frack, where they intend to get the water from, where they intend to dispose of the water, and on and on it goes. That simple baseline information that ought to be given to members of the public so that they can engage with regulators in an informed way. So all of those recommendations and more are going to be in this upcoming report. And um, I just think it's really important that we hold on to the fact that despite there being a lot of shitty things in our world and a lot of things to be concerned about, that there are people that are continuing to, to fight and, and work for change, and there are examples of positive things that are happening out there, and we really got to work hard to support those people that are on the front lines and that are trying to make a difference. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight, and we look forward to uh, taking some questions. Thank you.